Verse 28, let's read it. It says this. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heaven burdens. I will give you, as a father of a two-year-old and a five-month-old, um, rest. It's just something I don't know a lot about right now. I'd love if God could give me some. He said, take upon you, my yoke upon you, and let me Rest is something you learn. It's not something you do. You know how people say, I'll rest when I'm dead? You'll be dead faster if you don't rest. Or I'll rest when this situation, I'll rest, I can't rest. It's because you haven't learned how. He said, I'll teach you how to rest. He says, because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you Notice he does give you a burden. <laughs> he didn't say, I'm going to take everything and you're just chilling. He's like, no, you're going to carry something. It's just going to be really light what you carry. Let's pray, Father God, we're grateful for your presence in this place. You are the resurrection, which means, God, that you bring life to every single area of our existence. So in this moment, God, we declare that you are the King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords. And you're in this room right now, God, to breathe life into our mortal bodies. God, we're grateful. God, we're thankful. We say, speak to us for our ears and are open. And God, we're praying like we've prayed every year, that you would bless the ravens. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. High five two people on the way to your seat. Tell somebody this is purple country. This is purple country, just in case you were wondering. You, you, you're, you're, you're welcome um, to the body of Christ, but if you are not a Ravens fan, you're not my family. So uh, <laughs> I'm so serious. <laughs> I discovered something after being married five years now. Praise God. Some of you folks are like, I'm not impressed. We've been married longer than you've been alive. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> we're coming. We're trying to catch up. But I discovered that um, traveling on an airplane is exponentially easier when you're single <laughs> than when you're married. See, as a single man, if I was flying somewhere, Normally, I would take a backpack. I would stuff all of my belongings in said backpack. I'd walk out the door. I would get on the car, get on the little tram, go to the airport, get on the plane, and I'm gone. If I was on a long trip, I might take a carry-on and pack like the front half of it. Then the back half would be empty because nobody needs that many clothes. It's not until I got married to a woman just to clarify <laughs> that I learned <laughs> that traveling is a different ball game when you're married. We're going on a two day trip and my wife would say, hey, can you get me my suitcase? I'm like, babe, we're going for two days. What do you need a suitcase for? A carry on should be great. She said, I need a suitcase and bring her a suitcase. And there's like 12 different outfits in said suitcase four different pairs of heels, a couple of flats, some flip-flops, and then all the other paraphernalia that goes along with this trip. And I said, babe, we're there for two days. What do you need 12 outfits for? She says, I'm not going to know how I feel. Some sisters in the room know what I'm talking about. Until I get there and I dress how I feel. So I have to prepare for any feeling so that I can have the outfit for said feeling so that I can enjoy my trip. Who knew that you pack for optional feelings <laughs> days down the road? But what I did not know is that traveling with a wife had nothing in even the smallest areas to express how frustrating, how shameful, 
how humiliating and how character stretching it is to travel with infants. <laughs> Traveling with women is one thing. Traveling with babies, it's a whole different ballgame. I mean, it's no longer her suitcase, my suitcase, a backpack of Netflix, and we're good to go. It's my suitcase, it's her suitcase, it's their suitcase, then it's their stroller, their car seat, their pack and play, and their diaper bag. Are you counting? There is no airline that allows you to check that much free luggage, which means already, I'm like $300 more than I intended on spending on this trip. So you get to the airport and you're, you, forgive me, all of Jesus is gone before you get from long-term parking just to the check-in. And now that you have children, you can't just like get your ticket and go into the check-in. You actually have to talk to the agent because they want to make sure you're not kidnapping somebody else's child. So you stand in this obnoxiously long line, you get up to the, to the teller and, and she says, oh, you're traveling with a baby, we need the child's ID. Um, my child is five months old. They don't have a driver's license. They don't have a passport. They actually have no record that they are human or exist on this planet Earth. What do you want from me? Uh, we just need some proof that they are, are, are under two years old. <laughs> He's five months. Look at him. You have proof. Here's his, here's his social security card. It's all we have. It's the only thing that the government has given us to prove that he exists. This, this is unacceptable. It doesn't have his birth date on it. Do you mind if I climb back there and just... <laughs> so you finally get somebody with some sense to realize that the baby in the car seat could not be anything more than five months old and they let you through and my wife has babies and Zoe and, and she goes on through and, and, and it's cool when you have babies because to go through TSA, they don't really deal with you too much. They figure if you have a baby, you don't have a bomb. It's common sense. So you take the baby and you go on through. And my wife always grabs the babies and she goes on through. And then I'm left there <laughs> with this God-forsaken stroller having to get it through the little conveyor belt. And the little Excuse me, sir, you're going to have to break that down and put that through the conveyor belt. I said, okay, I can do this. I went to college. I'm educated. I lead a church. I'm smart. It's just this button here. Have you ever tried to break down some of these new strollers? You need a degree in biochemics, in marine biology, and in like astrophysics just to get this thing to fold down. And I'm trying to fold it. And there's people by, excuse me, sir, I'm late for my flight. I am too. Do you want to help? And after like 10 minutes of not being able to pack down this stupid stroller, finally a TSA person comes and says, well, you can just push it through on this side and we'll just pat it down. Why did you not just say that from the beginning? Our marriage is like on the rocks and we haven't even got to our seats yet. I walked through, I said, babe, you left me. You left me with that stroller. I was humiliated. And she said, oh, all you have to do is hit this and <laughs> There's something about traveling with a whole lot of baggage that makes life a lot more difficult, a lot more frustrating, and it slows you a lot down. You can't move at the speed that you want to move at. The joy of the Lord is no longer your strength. The offspring that you made, you begin to question, do I really need them? Is there another family on eBay or Craigslist that can benefit from these children at least until they turn 18? There's something about going through life with baggage 
that makes every day a rainy day, that makes every situation a frustrating situation, and just causes life to move a lot slower than we would like for it to move. The reality is every single person on planet Earth, we have emotional baggage that we are dragging and lugging through life that is slowing us down, that is frustrating seasons of joy, and then is keeping us from the peace that God would have for us. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says this, so then let's also run the race. Life was meant to be ran, not walked. Life was meant to be ran, not dragged. It says, run the race that is laid out in front of us since we have such a great cloud of witnesses, since there are people that believe in you and are cheering you on. Watch this, it said this. Let's throw off any extra baggage, getting rid of the sin of those issues that trip us up. I didn't have this in my story, but I was just thinking, you ever had one of those bags where the wheels don't work? And you're dragging this thing and it's hitting you in the ankle and you're just like at the end of the trip, just like, I don't need anything. I'll buy it when I get there. Listen to me. God never intended for you to travel that way or for you to live that way. The only problem is we pick up this baggage, but we don't know how to drop it. Over these next four weeks, we're going to unpack it. And, and by the way, if you're new to Destiny Church, we, we, we preach sermon series over four weeks instead of in one week. One of the reasons for that is because every preacher is very long-winded, uh, of which I am chief. So if I were to preach to you everything that I know about baggage, we would be here until the Ravens game was over, and um, that's not of God. So what we're going to do is we're going to break this thing up over four weeks, and we're going to unpack, no pun intended, over, pun all the way intended, laugh there, cha-ching, there we go, I was working on that one how to drop those things that we are dragging through life. Maybe you can feel like they're a part of our identity, not realizing that God never intended for you to live with that baggage and life would be so much more fluid and full of joy if you could just drop some things. If you could pull out your sermon notes, I'm gonna give you just three thoughts, three thoughts to start off this series and your sermon notes in your worship guide and you could fill in the blanks. The first one is this, everyone has baggage. It, it, it's so important. Baggage, and, and I'll be honest with you, we named this series Baggage because it's kind, of, it's kind of offensive. If I tell you, you have baggage, you don't know me. I don't have to, you're human. And life hurts. And the reality is, if you've been living on this planet that we call Earth for longer than five months, you've picked up some things that God never intended for you to have. It is impossible to make it through life, to interact with other humans that are not perfect and not pick up baggage. Matter of fact, if you're flying on an airplane and you don't have baggage, you automatically become a suspect. Why are you not flying with luggage? Are you not planning on coming back? We need to understand why are you so not concerned about the destination that you're getting to? It is impossible to go through life without picking up baggage. The only problem is we don't really realize where that baggage comes from. Some baggage comes from unfulfilled expectations. The Bible says this in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick. When you put your hope and your excitement and your desire in that business that you launched, in, in that relationship that you were so sure it was going to end in marriage or, or, or in that investment or that friendship or whatever it may be, the Bible says when you put all your hope in something and it doesn't come to pass, or maybe it does come to pass, just not the way you thought it would, yeah. it says you actually pick up a, 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 a sickness, you pick up a weight in your heart. And that sickness unaddressed becomes pain. Some of the pain that we pick up in our life when untreated becomes additional baggage in our lives. One of the things that I've discovered is there's a lot of, of areas in this world that can give you to numb your pain that never actually heals your pain. If you drink enough, your pain will be numbed for a season. And then in the morning when you wake up or the night, whenever you wake up, <laughs> you have a headache and the situation hasn't changed. 
You can numb your pain by going after another goal or going after another degree or, or going after another promotion or, or going after another relationship or whatever it may be. They'll give you medicine to numb your pain. But numbing your pain is not really treating your pain because you're not dealing with the source, you're dealing with the symptom. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14, they offer superficial treatments for my people's mortal wounds. He said, you're dying and somebody gives you a Band-Aid. They give assurances of peace when there is no peace. You know, all you need to do is look in the mirror every single morning and say, I am brave, I am courageous, I will do great. And you know what? Your life is going to follow your words. So I wake up in the morning and I look in the mirror and I say, I am brave and I am great. And then I go off and my life does not follow my words. Because a Band-Aid is not going to fix a mortal wound. Some baggage we picked up is unresolved yesterdays. I, I, this verse, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, it says this. Be angry. Let's just pause there. All you pacifists. Oh, you shouldn't be angry. It's not of God. God said, be angry. <laughs> be healed. <laughs> he said, be angry, but don't sin. In other words, it's not a sin to be angry. Do you know that God is angry? God is angry when your life hurts. God is angry when, when, when people are taken advantage of. God is angry when, when people are abused. God is angry. He's it, not always angry. I want you to know this idea of God is just always angry. But anger is not sin. But anger that's not controlled can turn into sin. And watch this. He said, here's how you keep your anger from turning into sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give place to the devil. In other words, what this writer is saying is you can be angry, but you need to deal with it. Because if you don't deal with it and you let the sun set and rise and set and rise and you go on and allow that anger to just sit there, what happens is there's now a seat and somebody's going to sit on that seat. Either grace and peace and forgiveness is going to sit on that seat or the enemy is going to come in and he's going to set up camp on that seat so you can be angry, but you need to deal with it. If that relationship broke apart and you said till death do us part and death did not do you part, you have the right to be angry, but you need to deal with that anger. If that person made a commitment, they said that they would be here for you or, or you were believing that that loved one would be healed and they weren't or whatever it may be, you can be angry. You just need to deal with it because if you don't deal with it and now it's going to become baggage that you carry. Unhealthy view of self. Man, feeling that I'm inadequate, that I don't have enough, that I can't take care of this or can't take care of that or whatever it may be. I'll be honest with you. This, by the way, this is the seventh anniversary of Destiny Church. Oh my gosh. We're still here. Where, where, where is that? What's that song? Is it Marvin Sapp or is it Hezekiah Walker? Now I would have made it. I would have lost it all, but now I see. That's Marvin Sapp, right? Because he's just like, you know me. <laughs> no, that was what I was singing the first Sunday of Destiny Church. I don't think I'm going to make it. <laughs> and can I tell you on that first Sunday of Destiny Church when over 331 people showed up and 27 people gave their life to Christ. I stood up in front of the church and I said, God is going to use this church to transform this city. Thousands of people are going to encounter God because of what he's doing in this house. And I did not believe one word of it. Because I knew me. And I knew how undisciplined I was. And I knew how I wasn't as great a leader as I was telling anybody. And I knew that I really didn't have a clue or a plan of what I was doing. And can I be honest with you? For the first 12 months of this church, I did not have one good night of sleep. 
Uh, I'm actually grateful, and this is TMI, but we're talking about baggage, so I might as well give you some of my baggage because I can't afford therapy, so I just talk to you people. <laughs> I got married in the second year of the church, and I'm grateful for my wife. She has been one of the greatest, not one of, that would sound bad, the greatest blessing that has ever happened to me here on earth, next to Jesus. Say that one. But I'm, I'm, gl I'm kind of glad that she wasn't there the first year of the church because I don't know if the first year of marriage would have been able to stand up under the lack of health that I had. Every Saturday night before church came, I would be up all night long, not writing messages, but just can't sleep because I, I was thinking this is going to be the Sunday where they all figure out it's a scam. <laughs> this is going to be the Sunday where they all just wake up and realize, wait, he doesn't know what he's doing. Why are we going to this kid's church? <laughs> Literally, not because God wasn't moving, not because God didn't call me to it, but because I didn't see myself the way that God saw me and I was carrying insecurities and baggage that was frustrating and slowing the process that God had for my life and had no clue that I was carrying things that God never, I thought it was humility. I thought, you know, pride is to say that you have what it takes. Humility is to, is to focus on your inadequacy. Pride is to focus on yourself, period. Your weaknesses or your strength. This is not the message, but this is good. <laughs> Humility is to give more attention to who God is than to who you are not. Another area of baggage is unrepented sin. Do you know just because you lived through it and nobody found out about it doesn't mean you got away with it? The Bible says this in Psalm 32, verse 3. It says, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. This is what David wrote when he had an affair and nobody knew. He said, I got away with it, but I didn't because the hand of the Lord was heavy upon me and you're drag. Man, Devin, come, 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 come. I'm almost out of time. Somebody say hi to Devin. Devin has issues, but we knew that. Devin, Devin, Devin thought that, that a relationship was going to work out, but it didn't. So now he has some, 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 some disappointments. Man, that's, that's pretty heavy, actually. And that disappointment, he didn't deal with the anger, so, so, so it turned into pain. Now, disappointment and pain. Hey, do me a favor. I don't have a lot of time. Can you walk over there and walk right back? <laughs> Boom. Okay, come on back. Come back. You can move pretty much with disappointment and pain. I mean, it's a little bit heavy, but you can still make it. But hmm, what are we going to add there? That's still a little insecurity in there because you think it's your fault that it didn't work out. And then you got fired right around that same season. And they said it was cutbacks, but they didn't cut anybody but you. <laughs> They be lying, they be lying, they be lying. You literally can't carry anything else. And when you get to the point in life where you literally can't carry anything else, the enemy will make sure to give you something else to carry. If you squeeze the suitcases together in the middle, you can hold this one. <laughs> Your life is a mess. <laughs> you know, your friends say that you're unreliable, but you can't support them. I don't know why. It's not like you got anything going on in your life. Oh, anyway, say that. Okay, so write this down, write this down. Everyone has baggage. The issue is it's hard to admit that you have baggage. There's this passage in John chapter 8, verse 31. It says this, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, it said, these were to people, <laughs> these were to Christians. It's not hard 
for people who are not Christians to say they have issues. I know I got issues. It's hard for Christians to admit that they have issues because somehow we believe that to have Jesus means that we don't have issues. And, and that if I have issues, you doing okay? Dude, you're sweating. It's because you got baggage. You know, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. You just need to give it to Jesus. But he's not here right now, so let's keep going. It says, Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word and you are my, my disciples, indeed, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you baggage free. They answered him and said, we are Abraham's descendants. These are Christians. Can I translate? Oh, we are members of Destiny Church. Oh, I serve on the dream team. I'm on the altar prayer team. I pray for other people's baggage after church. Thank you, Jesus. I've been through all the growth track. I finished growth track. Says so we, 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 we are the descendants of Abraham. We have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say we will be made free? In other words, they said, Jesus, we don't need freedom. We're already free. We are descendants of Abraham. Um, question for you. Have you ever read the Bible? Like any of it. If you haven't, let me help you out. You can open the Bible. You all right? <laughs> You can open the Bible and pick any book in there. And I promise you, you will find Israel in bondage. Open the Bible in the beginning, Egypt, slaves. He got you free. Open the Bible with the prophets, Babylon, slaves. He got you free. When they were having this conversation with Jesus, they were under the Roman Empire and they were not even free at the moment of this come. They spent their entire existence in bondage, yet they said, we've never been in bondage a day in our life. What, 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 what a picture of, of, of it's just hard. It, are you all right? <laughs> but I'm not going to teach people how to get rid of their baggage until week four. <laughs> Go ahead, drop it. Go ahead. Can y'all give it up for Devin? That's a preaching point right there. When you drop your baggage, sometimes it falls on people. If it's not frustrating enough to travel with infants and strollers and pack and plays and all that other good stuff, getting on the plane is only half the battle. When you land, there's this demonic area in an airport in which they call baggage claim. The baggage claim is a place where you are supposed to identify what burdens are yours and to take them with you. It, it, it's amazing to me. I, I don't know if you fly a lot, but it's some of the most entertaining stuff in life. It's crazy when you see somebody walking onto the airplane with a suitcase this size, calling it a carry-on. Like, sir, ma'am, that's not a carry-on. If it can't fit in the little thing, then, and they're like, oh, it'll fit. It will fit. It'll fit. <clears throat> if I just take the wheels off, then. <laughs> Why? Because if I carry it on, I don't have to claim it in baggage. So we will do everything we possibly can to call our issues normal. That's just how I am. It's my personality. I'm an introvert. I'm an extrovert. I'm a jerk. I'm a pacifist. I'm just nice. Or whatever we say to try to name our baggage so that we don't have to identify it as something that God wants us to drop. Here's the problem. It takes time to claim baggage. You got to stand there and wait for whoever is back there, the Muppets or whoever it is that's unloading my gear. You have to wait for them, put it on the belt and for it to come out on the belt. 
Do, do you realize that I fly a lot? There is baggage shaming. Where, where you sit down and, 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 and you watch people's baggage go by, and I have issues, so I just, I just try to match people's suitcase to them. Like, oh, who looks like that would be their suitcase? And, and it's amazing how it's all luggage. Everybody got draws in their luggage. But for some reason, we judge the luggage differently. If it's one of them jacked up suitcases that the handle's falling off and there's duct tape wrapped around it, we're just like, oh, that person got issues. <laughs> but if it's like one of those Louis Vuitton duffels coming back, like, ooh, whose bag is that? Who's going to claim that? That's pretty baggage. <laughs> baggage can be expensive. It can be pretty and it can be fashionable. But it still slows you down. And it's still not what God has for you. God help you. There's always that one person who their luggage opens up. You know what I mean? At least if you have baggage and it's all closed up, nobody knows. But when that suitcase breaks because they flung it three stories down on the conveyor belt, and it, I feel so bad for that person because it's just all their issues are spread all over that conveyor belt. And you're just like, oh. Me and my wife travel everywhere together. There's one time in our five years of marriage, right? In five years of marriage where we were both going someplace and we didn't travel together. I sent her home and, 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 and I was going to another city and she called me and she was traveling with the baby by herself. Payback. But I just said, man. <laughs> so I knew when she landed and I called her and said, babe, how are you? And, and husbands, you know, you can read the situation by the tone in the voice. And she's like, I'm good. And I'm like, oh no, what happened? Did he cry the whole way? She said, no, the suitcase broke open. Oh. I felt like this big. I'm like, oh, I should be there. I mean, baby stuff, bottles strewn, all paraphernalia. I mean, just, oh. It's hard to, 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 to claim our issues because we don't want people to identify us with that problem. I've discovered if I'm going to get free of my baggage, I have to value freedom more than I value dignity. If I'm going to get free of pride, I have to value freedom more than I value my wife thinking that I have everything under control. I'll pretend like I have it under control because I just want her to know she married a man, man. I got this. Got you, girl. <laughs> and what happens is we value the opinion of other people more than we value freedom and progress in our life. And God is saying, come to me. My, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. But, but I can't take from you something that you won't acknowledge that you have. The, the last thing is this, if you could write this down. Everyone has baggage. It's hard to, to claim our baggage, but God, God wants to take our baggage. Yeah. Like, I, 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 I don't travel like many places where I am like important when I get there. <laughs> Most of the places when I get there, like nobody knows who I am and nobody cares. <laughs> But this year, like honestly, probably for the first time, I got out of a plane. I was going to speak at another church and their hospitality was insane. And I get off the plane and I, and I walk through like the, you know, the security point where it's like, if you go back, we're going to shoot you. Just keep walking forward. I walk past that line. Y'all know that line because you look at it and then you look at the security guard. You're like, yeah, he probably would. Let me just go. And, and I walk through and there's somebody standing with a sign. But with my name on, <laughs> I was like, I'm the man, I'm the man, I'm the man. <laughs> Woo! And they said, pa Pastor Chandler. You, if you're new here, you don't know my dad's a pastor. He's been a pastor longer than I've been alive. Pastor Chandler is my dad, not me. I'm Stephen. <laughs> they said, Pastor Chandler. I said, yes. <laughs> I said, hi, I, 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 I'm here to drive you to, What? I said, awesome, here's my backpack. 
And then they said, did did you bring any luggage? I said, I did. They said, oh, well, let's go down to baggage claim. I'll claim your baggage for you. Really? You mean I don't have to guess? No, 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 no. Oh, by the way, here's the coffee that you ordered. I said, thank you. Can I be honest with you? When we got to that baggage claim, they said, which suitcase is yours? I said, that one. And I went to grab. They said, no, 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 I'll get it. And I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm Steven. I'm from Woodlawn, which is right outside of Baltimore. Like, I'm not used to people getting my bags. Like, nobody picks me up. I drive myself. <laughs> my wife doesn't even drive me. There's no, there's no everybody. <laughs> I just, when like people are like, ooh, the pastor, me held your bag. I get really uncomfortable. I'm like, that sounds like pride. And God's going to strike me. And I don't want to die. I'll get my own bag. And, and, and I said, I'll get it. They said, no, 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 no. I have to. I said, why? He said, because it's my job. I said, no, no, I'll get it. He said, you don't understand. I'm going to get in trouble if if, if I don't. We come up to the baggage claim of life, and there's the daddy issues, and there's the anger, and there's the abuse, and there's the guilt, and there's the shame, and we go to grab it, and Jesus is standing right there with your name on it saying, hey, is this your stuff? I've come to grab it. And then you say, no, 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 I don't want you to grab it. I don't want you to know that I have issues. I don't know. I want you to know that I have Jesus, no, 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 it's my job to grab your issues. It's my job to take that. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I want to take that from you. And you say, no, Jesus, I can't let you. I'm I'm ashamed because you're perfect and you're holy. And if you see that I have issues, you're going to judge me. And Jesus said, you don't understand. I'm going to get in trouble with my father if I don't grab your sins. Because that's the only reason that I came to earth is to take that burden off of you. So stop acting bougie. Stop acting like you have it all together and just say, Jesus, if you want it, here it is. Here's my addiction. Here's my struggle. Here's my insecurity. Here's my fear. Here's my anger. Here's my atheism. Here's my anger at you for letting that loved one die. Here it is. This is who I am. And sometimes we feel like he's surprised. Whoa, whoa, I didn't see that coming. He made you. He knows you. And he knows when you're carrying things that he never intended for you to carry. Your health is breaking down. Relationships are strained. The children keep on asking, mommy, are you okay? Daddy, what's wrong? It's amazing how kids can see stress on your face. Hey, read your mail. Friend call you, how's it going? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Friend has no clue. Little five-year-old says, mommy, I love you. Don't be sad, mommy. Jesus is saying, give that to me. Why do you want to carry that? Isaiah 53, 4 says this, yet it is our weaknesses that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own issues. But he was pierced for those times where we did not obey. He was crushed for those sinful decisions that we made. He was beaten so that we don't have to be broken anymore. And he was whipped so that we can be healed. Jesus said, I've done everything necessary for you to be free. There's only one thing that I can't do, and I can't force you to give that to me. That's a decision that you have to make. So why carry it? You don't have to. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful. God, because you said in your word that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And God, to be honest, we're tired. God, we've been carrying this burden for 
years, God, for decades, that word that that third grade teacher spoke over us, we've been trying to prove her wrong for all these years. The fact that that loved one walked out and we thought it was our fault, we've been carrying that for decades. But God, today we say, we don't want to carry that anymore. We lay it at your feet. Just where you are with your eyes closed and your head bowed, if you can pray this prayer with me, say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? And just give God a moment. Make this time, this message personal to you. Maybe you are a follower of God. You love Jesus. But you're carrying guilt, shame, mistakes that you made, issues, abuse, And you've never said, God, I've given you my life, but God, now I give you my fears and my shame and my mistakes. Or maybe you're in here and you've just never addressed God at all. You never even realized that he doesn't want to punish you for your mistakes. He wants to take them from you. If you're in here and you say, Pastor, I can't say that I've ever given the worst parts of my life to God. We think that being a Christian means being perfect. Being a Christian means you've given the worst parts of your life to God. And you trust that he's paid the price for them. If you're in this room, you say, Pastor, I can't say that I've ever done that. Or or I did it at one point and somehow I just picked up extra stuff. But today I want to give all that I am, the good, the bad, and the ugly, especially the ugly. I want to give it to him. And I believe that he wants it. If that's you, can you pray this prayer with me right where you're sitting? Say, Lord Jesus, here I am. I give you all of me. Thank you for dying on the cross, for taking the punishment for my mistakes. Make me whole. Make me yours. In Jesus' name, amen.